Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. Our guest this morning, Reverend Matt Eckerd, and I met almost six years ago. In the Assemblies of God in Indiana, they have broken the state into regions, sections. There's a lot of different names for them. And Edinburgh is the farthest point north of churches that are in this central, southeast, uh, would they give it some name? But it's the one I go to. It goes all the way down to Madison, all the way up to Edinburgh. So I met Matt at a couple of these events, and then I met Matt at camp. And we got to work at camp, but Matt and I developed a friendship and a relationship. And we would get together for coffee, most of the time breakfast. Uh, Cracker Barrel was a great halfway point, although I think um, it was a little closer for you. I'm not sure, but uh, they serve a great breakfast, so it's worth the drive. And we would spend some mornings there in Cracker Barrel talking about life, talking about church, talking about ministry. I know I'm not the first person that Matt shared what God placed on his heart, but I was one of the first. And he took a moment one day and he said, Pastor Rick, uh, I feel the Holy Spirit stirring me about some things. And he began to talk about a dream that the Holy Spirit put upon his heart, a difficult dream. Um, but one that the more he talked about it, the more his excitement level rose. Yet he looked at all of the various hurdles that he was going to have to go past. And Matt says, I feel called to be an evangelist, not just an evangelist, a traveling evangelist, not just a traveling evangelist who hops in a car and drives someplace, but one that lives out of an RV. And I said, now, wait a minute, how many kids do you have? And they just had had their baby. I'm thinking, you have walked in an RV before, have you not? Has your wife ever walked in one of these before? I said, this is what the Holy Spirit is calling us. So um, I, I have been praying with him, praying for him, encouraging him, and investing in him as much as I could. And now I've invited him to come and to bless us and invest in us this morning. Would you welcome our guest speaker, Pastor Matt Eckerd? actually forgotten that we were at camp together. And I think it was, maybe we were twice, but one of the years, uh, Rick was doing the fishing and they put me as the camp grandpa. <laughs> I think they made a mistake. <laughs> anyway, what a blessing it is to be here. And thank you, Pastor Rick. And thank you guys for having us. We're just blessed to be here today. Uh, you probably did see our motor home was parked out over here. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but just to, I just want to share for a moment, uh, you know, why we are doing what we're doing um, and introduce my wife. I have two of the older uh, children that are in here this morning. So I want to ask my wife, Nadine, Jessica, and Olivia, if you would stand so everybody can see who you are. And uh, can we thank the Lord for them? <laughs> Amen. I have three other uh, younger children, and they're off in kids' church and one's in the nursery, but... Uh, we're so blessed. I'll tell you, we've been on the road now. Uh, the first Sunday of May will be two years that we've been on the road full-time. And uh, so we have lived full-time in a 36-foot uh, motor home for two years. And I'll let you ask my kids what they think about it. They, they can think for themselves and, and answer for themselves. But uh, I just know that I hear a lot of the responses that they love it. And uh, in the last two years, the Lord has taken us in 31 different states. We've been able to minister all over. And when we first launched out, I really wanted to have a full itinerary of where we would go. Um, when I was about eight years old, I accepted Christ. And I'll never forget it. It was a little country church, a genuine experience where I felt the weight of sin leave me. You know, I've had people wonder, well, at eight years old, can it be a real experience? Is it, is it just uh, an emotion? But I felt the weight and guilt of sin leave me at eight years of age. 
And, uh, and, and that moment on, it was about a half a year after that, I was uh, flipping through a Bible that my dad had given me that was easier to read and understand. And I opened it up. I can't tell you today what scripture I read. If it would have been King James or New King James, I could probably have told you. But I can't remember. It was a different translation. But when I read it, uh, the words of the page jumped out at me. And the Lord told me that I would take the gospel and I would travel. That's never left me. And so uh, in 96, when I uh, surrendered everything to the Lord and went to Bible school and uh, came back, I was always ready at every transition to go and take the gospel out. We ended up as youth ministers for five years and then uh, pastored two different churches for 13 years. And uh, here we were in Edinburgh, and really I felt in my spirit that I could be there the rest of my life. Uh, and then the Lord began to move on my heart, and as Pastor Rick shared. And so we launched out. But what happened uh, in that is I needed confirmation from the Lord. How many of you know if you're going to do something God called you to do, it's good to have some confirmation? And there's nothing wrong with having a plan. And so we had a plan, what we thought was from the Lord, but I needed just greater confirmation. If you don't have confirmation from the Lord, when things get rough, you're not going to stick to what God asked you to do. (laughs) Because you'll start thinking, was it just me? Was it my idea? But when God tells you to do something, then you're free to go and say, God, it's your thing. You told me to do it. And so uh, one one, uh, day, I don't remember, it doesn't matter what day of the week it was, I was walking down the side hall of the sanctuary there in Edinburgh. I walked into the back of the sanctuary with a bunch of papers in my hand. And as soon as I walked into the sanctuary, I felt the manifest power and presence of God. And I'm just going to be honest, stronger than I've ever felt it in my entire life. So being raised in church, what do you do? You go to the altar. I went to the steps that we had there and I kneeled. And I didn't kneel but just a second and it just wasn't it. And I, I paced the floor. I, I pace a lot when I pray and, and prepare. And I, and, and I could feel the power and presence of God so strong. And, and I laid on the floor and I, nothing was working. I just felt so undone in God's presence. And so I just went and I sat on the steps and I said, Lord, what do you want? And I don't want to over-spiritualize this. The Lord didn't speak audibly to me in this. But he's never told me to do this before, and I know he meant it. He said, take off your shoes. And so I slipped off my shoes. I went and I sat on the front row of chairs, and here's what I told the Lord. I don't, I don't care how long it takes. I'm not leaving until you tell me why you told me to take off my shoes. I'll stay here all day. I'll stay here all night. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going home. I'm not moving from the sanctuary until you speak. And I'm so thankful that God didn't take very long <laughs> because I was willing, you know, to stick it out for the long haul. But uh, shortly after, the Lord said, go give me your shoes. And so I went up and I'll, I'll never forget, I just took my shoes. I was the only one in the building and I just held my shoes up. And when I did, here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. When you put on these shoes, you're going to go where I tell you to go. You're going to say what I tell you to say and I'm going to provide for you. I went home, I told my wife, she was thrilled And I I don't have time to tell you the story, but the very next day I got a phone call for an invitation uh, to go speak in the country of Haiti. Me and my wife went. Uh, The phone call was one of these where it was like, hey, can you go? I said, yes. They didn't know what God had just told me. And then they said, by the way, somebody just called and said they want to pay for your whole trip. God just said you go where I say, say what I say. So I had two services lined up and we launched out. Pastor Rick, that seemed a little crazy, right? You know, I really wanted to have a full itinerary. And every time I would pick up the phone and I would start to call pastors or churches, the Holy Spirit would say no. I'd be like, well, Lord, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, how, how is this going to work? And the Holy Spirit would say, trust me. And so when we went out and we had those two services and we've just been faithful to the Lord and God has taken care of us the entire time. And I don't say this with arrogance, but I say this because I'm telling you, it's a relief for me to know that we are booked all the way up to the last Sunday of November of this year. And I've already got services all the way into March of 2019. I don't, I'd only say that to say this. If you will trust God with every area and detail of your life, if you'll just fully trust Him and surrender everything to God, listen, the sky is the limit to what God can do to a yielded vessel. Some and that has yielded to him. I'm not any different than any one of you in here. There's people that have sacrificed way more than I have ever have or ever will in serving or following God. So I don't put myself up here or, or say it to you as though I'm somewhere you're not. I'm just telling you that all of us, every one of us, if we'll surrender everything to God and stop living for ourselves, God will use us for his glory. But so many times we will not do it because we're afraid. We don't have it all figured out. We don't know what to do. I'm going to tell you what. You can trust God and God will give you a plan. God will give you the right things to do. God isn't going to just say, trust me and, and, and I'm not going to give you any help. No, if he calls you, he'll equip you. He'll, he'll open doors for you. He'll take care of you in your life. So in any area that you're struggling with trusting God today, I just want to encourage you, trust him. Trust Him with everything that you've got. Quit worrying, quit doubting, and trust God. Why don't you dive all in and trust God with everything? Why don't you today decide that you're going to die to yourself so that Christ can live inside of you? 
Too many of us are alive to ourselves. We're alive unto sin and dead unto God. But the Bible says we're supposed to be dead to sin and alive unto God. And we're willing to, to die to ourselves and say, Lord, do in me whatever you want to do in me. Lord, have your way. Then, then I'll tell you, that's what God's looking for. We're living in a day and age where God is looking for some people. He's looking for people today that will be broken. People that today will be yielded and surrendered so that God can use you for His glory. We're living in a day and age where people need to hear the gospel. They've always needed to hear the gospel. But you know what? I, I don't know about you, but I know when I grew up, I had a grandma and grandpa that prayed for me. I'm a third generational preacher, so there's all kinds of Christians in my family. Family. But it wasn't always that way. There's so many of you that would say, I had a grandma or a grandpa praying for me. But you know what we see when we travel today? There are people that say, this is my first time I've ever even been in church. I don't know how it happens, but we pray before we go places. Sometimes people will come in and they just felt like they should go there that Sunday. And they've never even been to church. We were at one church and a guy in his 20s accepted Christ, had never stepped foot in a church in his life. See, that's the kind of day we're living in. We're living in a day where the gospel isn't going out like it used to in that kind of a way. And not everybody can say, I've got somebody praying for me. I want to ask you a question. How many of you want to leave here today and go with His presence? You want to go with the presence of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to just come in here and just get a goosebump or feel good. No, you do want to come in and be changed. You've got to be changed to go out and make a difference. But how many of you would say right now, when I leave here today, I want to leave changed i want to leave with the power of the holy spirit i want to leave with the presence of the holy spirit stronger than i had the presence of god in me yesterday well you know what that's going to require don't you you've got to die so you can live Paul, paul said he was uh, de dead unto sin uh, you know he, he, he said this it's not not i that live but christ lives within me you know what he also said he was dead to the world i've got to be dead to this world this world has nothing for me the Bible says we're strangers, we're aliens. First Peter says we're sojourners, we're just, we're just passing through. This world has nothing for me. This world has absolutely nothing for you. He said, well, uh, is that all you're going to talk about? Is that I need to die and surrender? Maybe. <laughs> Listen, I, I want to talk with you this morning about going with His presence. I'm going to share with you about four Old Testament scriptures that I'll try to do slow uh, because they're, I want you to really catch it and have time to turn or to go to your Bible app and uh, scroll. Uh, and, and I'm going to do this from the New King James Version. And the reason why is because in the New King James, these four passages have a very similar way of saying something that drives the point home. So if you have New King James, if not, I'm going to read it to you from New King James. Uh, and you'll see what I'm saying. But NIV and uh, even King James said a little bit different. But uh, different translations will say what I'm going to show you a little differently. But 1 Kings chapter 3 is where we're going to start. And then we're going to go from 1 Kings to the book of Numbers, to the book of Deuteronomy, and then to the book of Joshua. So I'm going to start in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. And while you turn there, I just want to surrender myself and yield myself to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you, Lord, that you would have your way in me today. Lord, I thank you for your presence. It's already here. Lord, your presence, it's not, it's not that I'm inviting you because I thank you that you were here before I ever came. I thank you for your presence in worship. I thank you for your presence in this house. And so, Lord, I just surrender myself to you. I yield to your will and to your way, and I ask that you would use me as a vessel for your glory and for your honor. May my, my tongue be as the pen of a ready writer. Lord, I ask that you would use me for your glory, and I ask you that our hearts would be soft and our ears would be open, that, Lord, we can truly receive from you today. The Holy Spirit, I ask you for crippling conviction for anyone that is never surrendered her life to you. I ask you for crippling conviction today. I ask you, Lord, for comfort for those who need comfort. I ask you for healing for those who need healing. Lord, I just ask you to do what you want to do and use me today. I'm yours. We're yours. We ask you that we'll have an encounter with you today. Lord, for the glory of your spirit, I ask you to fill this place with the glory of your presence and that, Lord, every one of us will leave here changed by the power of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 says this, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth and righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne. As it is this day, now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I am a little child. Here's what I want you to notice. Right, he says next. I do not know how to go out or to come in. He says, I do not know. What does that even mean? 
I don't know how to go out and I don't know how to come in. Is he talking because he's young and he doesn't know how to lead? I mean, that could be part of it. Obviously, he says, I'm a child. I don't know how to go out or come in. But then I want you to look at Numbers chapter 27. Because in Numbers chapter 27, starting verse 15, you're going to see the same thing said by someone who is not young at all. And they say the very same thing that Solomon says when he says, I'm a child, I don't know how to go out or come in. But in Numbers 27 and verse 15, Moses, it says, spoke to the Lord saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, in Numbers 27, 15, who may go out before them and go in before them. Now listen to what he says next. Who may lead them out and bring them in. That the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. See, Moses, he's asking God for a successor. He's, he's asking, uh, you know, God for someone who knows how to take the people out and how to bring the people in. But for what? What is it even talking about? Why did Solomon say, I'm a child, I don't know how to take him out or bring him in? Why does, why does Moses say, I, you know, I need somebody that knows how to take him out, lead him out and bring him in? We'll look at Deuteronomy 31 and verses 1 and 2. In Deuteronomy 31, we see a very similar thing. Matter of fact, it's, it's almost identical. Moses, it says, then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel. In Deuteronomy verse 1, verse 2, And he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you should not cross over this Jordan. See, Moses was going to give the people a new pastor, so to speak, someone, because he could no longer take them out and bring them in. So he's saying, Lord, bring them, me someone, give them someone. He said, what does this mean? Why does Solomon say, you know, I, I don't know how to go out and come in? Why is Moses, what is he even referring to? You could go on and on with all these ideas. But I really think Joshua 14 and verse 11 really tells us what it's all about. Joshua 14 and verse 11, listen to what he says. He says, as yet... I am as strong this day as the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then. Now listen to what he says. So now is my strength for war. What? So is my strength for war. Why? Both for going out and coming in. Whoa, okay, wait a minute. These are leaders, every one of them. They're talking about taking the people out and bringing them in. And they need wisdom. They need ability to be able to do this. What is this even referring? It's a warfare statement. It's taking the people. It's the people going out and the people coming in. And how do you make that transition? And what does life look like? And listen, why? This is a warfare statement where they were out in war. And so while they're out in war, being led in war, they're worn out. They're tired. They've gone through a lot of stuff. And they need to know how to come in and have someone says, here, you come in. And now you come in and you get refreshed. You get ready because guess what? You're not staying here. You're going back out. Now this, in my opinion, and what I believe it's really talking about for us, is coming in is symbolic of coming in to worship, and going out is going out and witnessing. How many of you know we're, we're in a warfare? Matter of fact, I know that we are. The Bible wouldn't say the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God. They're not, they're not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. The Bible talks about warfare. And listen, if you don't think you're in, in a war, then you're probably losing it right now. Now, I know that Jesus has already won the war and we're in a battle. And you know what I find myself battling? I find myself battling my flesh. I find myself battling uh, not, not individuals, not other flesh, but spiritual wickedness in high places. I find myself in a battle all the time. And you know what happens when you're in a battle? In times of battle, you can get worn out real quick because you're out there. You're giving it all you've got. You've been, but listen, how did you even know how to go into battle? Because you prepared yourself. Because you learned to put on the full armor of God. Why do I need the full armor of God? So that I can stand against all the wiles, the attacks, the schemings of the devil. It's warfare. And so he said, you, know, you come in and you, you listen, this coming in into worship is to come in and prepare ourselves, get ourselves ready so that we can go back out. Now listen, I don't want you to think that the only time we prepare ourselves for war is when we come to a church service, although that's a huge part of it. Don't get me wrong. It's of the utmost importance, but also you and I need to learn that we have to keep coming into the presence of God. You can't just be like, I want to be in his presence once in a while. You're going to get your hind end whipped in war. Because we need the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. We need to be taught. We need to grow. We need to learn what it means to be fully armored. What it means to surrender, to lay down everything, to die to ourselves, that Christ can live within us. And go out and see a lost and hurting world come to know Christ. But until we get rid of some of the stuff that we carry on a continual basis that wears us out and drags us down, causes us to only think about us, our problems, our woes, and our lives, 
Until we can find a way out of that, and, and then we can go out and people say, what's happened to you? Something has changed in you. All of a sudden you got an opportunity to tell about the hope that lies within you. What's the Bible say? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You know what happens when you got a testimony of Jesus? The Bible says that, 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 the, that the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Now listen, I've grown up in church all my life. and we, How many of you have ever heard some crazy testimonies? <laughs> remember those days back in the day? I, I remember hearing some testimonies that were not magnifying Jesus at all. They would have been better left today. You just post it on Facebook. Leave it there. <laughs> but they about testify about everything. But when you testify about Jesus, when you say, you know what? I was blind, but now I see. I was depressed. I was down and out. And, and you know what happened to me when I come into God's presence? Something happened. I, I, I changed. I've been relieved. I've been set free. And I've got the joy of the Lord. What are you t- you're testifying about Jesus and it releases a spirit of prophecy. What does that even mean? Well, to me, it's in the simplest way. It's like it builds faith in everybody else. There's a release in the atmosphere where they're like, God did it for him. God did it for him. Him, him, do it for me. And so, you know, we, we come in, but see, if we don't ever get rid of the stuff, if we don't find an outlet, if we don't find a way to be refreshed in the battle that we're living, then we are ineffective in the warfare and in the battle that we're in. But if we learn this great truth that they knew in the Old Testament, and by the way, even Colossians, t- Colossians tells us that all of these things, they're, they're for our benefit. Even the things of the, that are, that this, of the Sabbath and the teachings of, of, of all the Old Testament, they're for our benefit. And so when we look at these, you say, well, what does this mean to me? What is, it, what is this telling me? I'm telling you what it's telling us. It's telling us that we are in a war. We're in it. And so we have to continue to come into the presence of God. Let me give you a couple other scriptures before I go any farther. Jeremiah 17, verse 19 through 21. This is about coming into the presence of God. So we've got to learn to come in through worship. Come into the presence of God. Whether it's, uh, listen, you know what you've got to do tomorrow? I say you've got to, you get to. You have the opportunity to do this if you want to tomorrow. You have the opportunity tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening to get into the presence of God through worship. You have the opportunity to do it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I want to tell you something. If you've been doing that all week long and you come in here on Sunday, if all of us did that and you come in here on Sunday, you know what's going to happen? The roof's going to come off this place. Because you're catching on to something. You've been coming into His presence and you're also going to find your life is more effective. Why? What happens in His presence? All kinds of amazing things, things happen in the presence of God. In Jeremiah 17, verse 19, he says, Thus says the the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, by which the kings of Judah come in, and by which they go out. There we go again, coming in and going out. And all the gates of Jerusalem, and say to them, Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah, all and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, who enter by these gates. Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourself and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. You know what God is saying? He's saying when you come into my presence, you've got to lay your burdens down. You know what happens if you don't ever lay your burdens down? If you don't truly come into worship, then what happens is you come in burdened and you leave burdened. Listen, if you do that, it's nobody else's fault but yours. See, I'm here and I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going down the road to another church. You know, well, I will be here Wednesday. I better back up. I'm leaving Thursday. <laughs> but, you know, if we just, if, if we come in and we're expecting everybody else to take us into God's presence, you've got something wrong. I'll tell you something. If I live my life only looking for what everybody else could do for me in my walk with God, I wouldn't get very far with God. As people come and go, seasons change, things change in our life. But when you learn how to worship God on your own and get in the presence of God on your own time, everything changes. Everything in your life changes. And you know what? So, like, you know what? I heard this said, uh, an older pastor I heard say this not too long ago, and I just stuck with me. I was in Texas. The pastor told me this. They said, one of the greatest things they've heard of worship is this. Worship is love responding to love. Love responding to love. So you can talk about what all worship looks like, but I'm going to tell you something. From the moment you walk in and everything that is done in here is an act of worship. 
We know that singing is an act of worship. But you know communion is an act of worship. Did you know fellowshipping is an act of worship? Reading your word and prayer is an act of worship. It's love responding to love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever will believe in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. What's the motivation behind all of that? God so loved the world that He gave. God so loved the world that if you will receive Him and love Him back, everything changes. It's love responding to love. And when you learn that worship is more than a song or a style or what makes you feel good or gets you in or gets you out, you've got to get beyond a feeling. Let me tell you something. You weren't saved by feelings. You were saved by grace through faith. And your walk can't be a walk of by feelings. It's got to be a walk of faith. And so you and I can learn to come into the presence. You say, well, I'm always in the presence of God. Well, I understand. He's everywhere. The whole earth belongs to the Lord. His, he, he fills every, every square inch of the atmosphere. But listen, you and I know well, there's a difference between being in His presence and being in His presence. Because <laughs> what happens when you've been in the presence of God? Things change. You can say, I was in the presence of God today. Why? I got touched. A guilt left me. Shame left me. I got a healing in my body or I just have a peace about me that I can't explain. My situation is just as bad as it ever was. Matter of fact, things are worse, but I feel great. How did that happen? His presence. In His presence, all things change. All things are made new in His presence. So when He says, don't come bearing a burden, you say, well, how many of you have ever felt like you're not worthy to come into God's presence? How many of you felt like you've lived like the devil so much and, and, or you didn't really live like the devil but you messed up enough that week that how can you, how can you go to church on Sunday and how could you even begin if you even get there to raise your hands and worship because you're not worthy? I grew up in church. I remember in church feeling like if I even did this, if I even give the slightest bit of raising my hand or any surrender to God, not that you have to do that, but I wanted to. That's why I'm telling you. I wanted to. I wanted to be free in worship. I wanted to surrender myself to the Lord. But every time I'd start to, I'd feel guilty because I knew that around me there was 15 or 20 teenagers that knew what I did that week. <laughs> and they'd be saying, look at the preacher's kid. Oh, he thinks, oh, well, look at him raising his hands. You know, finally, when I grew past that, I realized... God is looking for surrendered people. Is He looking for perfection? He's looking for surrender. He's looking for obedience. To obey is better than any sacrifice. He's looking for those that will obey Him and love Him in such a way. And then when you love Him in such a way that, you know what, people matter, but really they don't matter in the scope and the big scope of things. What you really care about is loving God. And you respond to His love. He's been so gracious to you. You You know, those who have been forgiven a lot, what do they do? They love a lot. I was just at it. I went to churches every week. I've been in some churches where I've seen people worship so extravagantly that other people would say, that's, diff- that's difficult for me to watch. They distru- they're disturbing. Because they're dancing and they're dancing extravagant. Or they're weeping at an altar and laying themselves out on an altar. And some people would be like, I'm uncomfortable with that. I, I don't know what's going on. You know what? I was in a church where a lot of that was happening recently. And you know what the Holy Spirit said to me as soon as it began to break out? Here's what the Holy Spirit said to me. He reminded me of that scripture. Who him has been forgiven much, loves much. I realize I don't know what that person that's dancing before the Lord what they went through and now they're free I don't know you don't have to worship that way worship's not about an expression of the way it's expressed it is an expression of love responding to love and here's what happens when you surrender to his love and his presence things change how many of you got burdens who doesn't Let me ask you that. Who here has no burdens? Would you raise your hand? (laughs) You know what Jesus said in Matthew? He said this, Come unto me, all. Did Jesus say, Come unto me, young? Did Jesus say, Come unto me, old? Did Jesus say, Come unto me, uh, chubby or thin? Did Jesus say, Come to me, black or white? Did Jesus say, Come to me, middle-aged? Did Jesus say, Come to me, millennials? Did Jesus say, Come to me, no! Did Jesus say, come to me lost? Did Jesus say, come to me saved? Jesus said, come unto me all. Well, for what? What reason am I coming? To, why did Jesus say, come unto me? Come unto me all who are weary and heavy burdened, are burdened, heavy laden. All, all. So I'm not good enough. Jesus didn't say, come to me perfect. He didn't say, come to me saint. He didn't say, come to me sinner. He said, come unto me all. What's the, what, what's the prerequisite? You just got to be... Born, <laughs> breathing, alive, 
Come to me, all who are weary. You say, well, I'm tired. No, weary is beyond tired. Weary, a nap is going to take care of you. You could sleep for three or four days and wake up just as weary or more weary than you were before because sleep is not what you need. It's because deep in your soul there is an unrest. There is a battle going on within you. And there is a battle that you don't see where the devil's trying to take you out of the knees. Steal, kill, and destroy from you. But Jesus said that I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly in fullness. And so you know what happened? Jesus is coming to me all who are weary. You're worn out. You're tired in the game. You're tired in the battle. You've been serving God for 20 years, but yet you're wiped out. You've been serving God a long time, but now you've got this and you've got that. And you're focusing on this and you're focusing on that. And you love God as you've always loved Him, but your love isn't quite as fervent. Your response isn't quite as, as quick as it used to be. Your love is maybe growing cold or you're just tired. You're just weary. Or you're burdened down with the weight of sin and the weight of the world and the weight of jobs and all this stuff. Jesus said, come to me. You know what he says? Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. How many of you need some rest? Tell you what. Ain't nothing wrong with your this and that to help you rest. I'm not going to knock anything. But I'm going to tell you what really will bring you true rest is when you come to Jesus and do this. Come all who are weary and burdened. and I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon me and learn. How many of you need to learn? I need to be taught by the best teacher that ever lived. His name is Jesus. I need his rest and I need his teaching. He says, learn from me. What does he say in there? He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There has to be an exchange. There has to be something. See, they had an understanding in the Old Testament of something we can't forget in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, that when we come, we come and we lay our burdens down. If you have not been learning as a believer to lay your burdens down, you're carrying burdens with you that you were not meant to carry. You're carrying stress with you that you were not meant to stress and carry. Jesus says, come unto me and give it to me. You say, give it to you. How do I give it to you? You love on the Lord. You receive his love and you say, here I am. Lord, fix me. <laughs> Lord, help me. You know, something amazing happens when you actually do that. He shows up. Because he's able and willing the entire time. But you know what? God has given you a free will where you can say, I'll fix it on my own. I'll fix it on my own. I'll, I'll figure out another way. I'll make another plan. I'll make a way. I'll make a way. I'll do this. I'll do that. And the whole time, it's not, the Lord's not looking at you as though, oh, you pitiful thing. I've just, I'm so mad at you if you just come. No, listen. It's an open door. He said it. He said it all through the ages. Come to me. I'll give you rest. <laughs> come to me. Learn from me. Well, it's 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all of your cares upon me, upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. How many of you have been casting your care on everybody else? <laughs> and then there's a time for it, right? We're, we, it, you know, we confess our faults to one another and we share with one another. But let's, let's not forget that we need to be taking it to Christ first and foremost. Because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people that you go to and you'll cast all of your cares. And you cast all of your cares... And here's the thing. You're like, I can talk to them. They care for me. You know what? They can be healthy and it can be unhealthy, depending. There's a whole lot of scenarios there. <laughs> right? Now, I'm not saying be a closed up person with walls all around you and don't open up to anybody. But you should cast your cares on Jesus, not on everybody else. Because here's what happens. I start casting my cares on my brother and I think, and I could tell he listens to me. You know, he's, he's listening. I feel better after I've talked with him. But here's what's going on in his mind. Maybe he does care. Maybe he is listening. Maybe he's taking it to the throne of grace. But maybe he's thinking, man, my show's going to start in 20 minutes. Because he is not God. <laughs> man, man I get, I, I'm going to get out. I got to go out there and scope out my spot in the woods. I got to get dinner started. I got things I got to do. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't hear a word you're saying. And then they catch themselves and they're like, well, I hope they don't ask me if I agree because I don't even know what they said the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Go ahead and cast all your cares on them. You say, well, they do care for me. Nobody cares for you like Jesus. Nobody. You get mad at them because they're dozing off and drifting. You know why? They got their own problems. <laughs> and sometimes they'll weep with you because you're weeping, but really inside they're saying, woo, about time they got some hardship. 
I've been serving the Lord 20 years longer than them, paying my tithe faithfully, and they've been having everything handed to them about time they have. But they're saying, oh, yes, God knows. And inside they're saying, woohoo! But watch who you cast your cares on. Rejoice with those who rejoice. That's a hard one. They, they're coming, they're like, you don't believe what happened. I got a huge raise, and my goodness, God blessed me. This was given to me, and God's done this and that. You're supposed to rejoice with your brother. And inside you're thinking, oh, that's great. And you're thinking, you jerk. When am I going to get mine? When's my, where's my... See, you've got to be careful who you cast all your stuff on. There's a solution. Cast your cares on Him. Why? He's the one who cares for you. There's nobody that cares for you like Jesus. Nobody. Nobody at all will care for you like Jesus. You know, you know what I love? Is growing up in church, I knew, I knew that there was help if I would just respond. If I would just surrender. I knew that he loved me. I knew that he would help me. But I was fearful. I was all this other stuff. I didn't want to die to myself. I, you know, I didn't know what to do. But I tell you, when I learned, you know, there was a song. that When it would be sang in church when I was growing up, I, I, it would just, it would just make me just melt. As the deer panteth toward the water, so my soul longeth after thee. I could not contain myself as a kid. I would grab the pew in front of me. Want to know why? Because that was me and my spirit. People didn't know it, but all I wanted was God. And I'll never forget when finally I said, I'm not fighting God anymore. I'll never forget surrendering and laying it all down. I want, I want to wrap this up. I want to show you something real quick that's real powerful. This is real powerful. It's just straight out of the Word of God. Ezekiel 46 and verse 9. Ezekiel 46 and verse 9 says this, But when the people of the land come in before the Lord on the appointed feast days, whoever enters in by way of the north gate, why? To worship. Why do they enter in? Oh, I'm not making it up. To enter in to worship. That's what he says. Shall go out by way of the south gate. And whoever enters by the way of the south gate shall go out by the north gate. He shall not return by the gate through which he came, but shall go out to the opposite gate. If you come next week, and Pastor Rick told you, that's fine if you come in this door, but I want you to go out the most inconvenient door when you leave. (laughs) You came in, you say, wait a minute, my donkey's out there. You get me? My car's out there. Now, why would I do that? You think, well, he's lost his mind. He has become a total control freak, telling me which way I have to come in and leave the church. But these people knew there was a reason that they come in one way and they leave another. And there's something for all of us, too. We shouldn't leave here like we came in Jesus' name. Bound, depressed, tormented, sick or lame. For the Holy Ghost of Acts is just the same. You don't have to leave here like you came. Whoa, hallelujah. When you get into the presence of God on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you can get changed in the presence of God. Your circumstance may never change or might not change for a long time, but you can change. Did you say, I've been in God's presence. You were not made to be like a pond or a lake, but like a river. Because here's what happens once you start worshiping and you're giving it all to the Lord. You're releasing it. And good things are coming to you. You go out, you come in one way and you go out another. And if we're not careful, that's how we live the Christian life. One of only worship where we receive, we receive, we receive, we receive. You know what constipation is? Constipation is taking more than you let out. You said, he just said the word constipation from the pulpit? Oh, hang in there, I might say something worse. How many of you know what it is, Right? It's when Amy Grant had this song in the 80s or something when I was a kid about fat baby Christians. They just, oh, more of the word. Oh, Lord, we love you. Fat, 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 fat. You know what happens? Stale, stagnant. I know a lot of Christians look like they were baptized in lemon juice and lead a tall glass of prune juice. I've been in a way for 30 years. Bless God, I was saved when I was 13. And I haven't smiled since. And the world wants what you have, right? Yeah, they want to come sit next to you. I don't mean to make fun, but listen. We have to keep coming in and keep going out. See, when you come in and you lay your burdens down, whether it's in your car on the way to work in the presence of God or Sunday. And listen, you need these times of corporate praise and worship where the anointing is flowing through the preaching and where God's people are united together wanting a move of God, wanting Holy Ghost to move and take our stuff from us. Lay it down together and get free. So what do we do? We go out as a mighty army to do the work of God. See, David, 
You think of David, you think of a warrior and a worshiper. He knew how to come in and he knew how to go out to war. Matter of fact, it made some people very angry because at one point, what did the people sing? They sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. He was a man of war, but a man of worship. And so this man of worship and war did something one time. He stopped going out. He only came in. And when he stopped going out, he noticed everything else. He stopped engaging in battle and started engaging in breaking all of the Ten Commandments. He saw what he wanted. He killed a man to take her. He did everything in his power to have the woman that he had been watching from the rooftop. You know what he stopped doing? He stopped coming in and going out. He just came in. You know why the church sometimes is so a mess and constipated? Because all we do is come in. Oh, I want more. I want more. Oh, give me more. But you're not ever going out and saying, you know what? Christ has set me free. He said, well, I don't want to have a megaphone or I don't want to be an evangelist. No, but do you want to be a child of God that has the joy of the Lord and other people see it and you're not afraid or ashamed to tell them about Jesus? Well, I got my own problems. I got stuff. I don't feel like sharing Jesus. You forgot you got to come in and lay a burden down so you can go out. Whew. Do you love the Lord? I love the Lord. We're going to transition here. And... Uh, but we're going to have a moment of prayer here in just a, a, little, just a few minutes. And we're going to pray for you that whatever need you have, the Lord is able to meet it. And I want to tell you that we have, as we have been traveling, last week I saw a man who was so blinded, he had 5% vision. And I was standing in front of him, he says, I barely see your face. And as we prayed for that man, here's what he began to see. I put my hands here and he grabbed my hands and his eyes began to get whiter. And he said, I can see the whole church. He said, I see the back walls. I saw an eye that was completely blind looking to the right. Me and my wife prayed for that woman for a good period of time. That eye straightened up. Vision came and all paralysis on the left side of her body left. And she was totally healed. We saw God do amazing things. But the most amazing thing is this. Is if you're lost and you come to Christ and you're forgiven of your sins and made new in Christ. That's the greatest thing I've ever seen. It's God take a hard heart and soften it. And when they come in one way, they leave another. So you don't have to leave here like you came. Amen. Bound, depressed, tormented, sick or lame. You want to know why? The Holy Ghost of Acts is just the same. I love you guys. God's good, isn't he? You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.